I have at least two reasons for beginning this study this morning. One, it fits into the matter of handling a right or rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, as it applies to the Old Testament and specifically the law of Moses. In the process of studying what we will there, which will be the Sabbath, we'll also be dealing with those people today who erroneously teach that we're still to keep the Sabbath and not what the Bible teaches about Christians assembling to worship on the first day of the week. So the persistent claims of the Sabbatarians and the frequent reference to the Sabbath by many others show great confusion among people who attend various churches and are part of them. And so for that reason, I want us to, and the reasons I've also given, other reasons I've given, to discuss what the Bible teaches on this subject. I want to look first of all at the first mention of the Sabbath. There is no law in the book of Genesis relative to the Sabbath, none whatsoever. Nor any indication that it was observed at all for the first 2,500 years of the world's history. The first mention of the Sabbath is in connection with the giving of manna when the children of Israel were in the wilderness wandering having left Egypt and added for the land of promise, the land of Canaan, Exodus chapter 16, verses 22 through 30. Now in preparation of the Sabbath, the Jews were required to gather twice as much on the sixth day as on previous days. And the reason for this was that the Sabbath day, according to the law of Moses, was a solemn rest. A holy Sabbath under the Lord. The whole circumstance shows that the people up at that time were unacquainted with such an institution as keeping the Sabbath. About 30 days later, the Sabbath law was incorporated into the Ten Commandments. Spoken, of course, from Mount Sinai by God through Moses to the children of Israel and then written on tables of stone, Exodus chapter 20. This must be also understood as we dissect what the Old Testament says about the Sabbath. In Exodus 24, rather 34, verses 27 and 28, we learn that the Sabbath was given to ancient Israel, and let me underscore the next word, only. The Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words. For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. Then he said, And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Again, that's Exodus 34, verses 27 and 28. Notice this also concerning the fathers, as the scripture refers to them, who preceded Moses and the children of Israel before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and observe to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Sinai was also called Horeb. Horeb called Sinai. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. Now that's in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means a restatement of the law. This is just before Moses is to die on Mount Nebo and before Joshua would take up the lead of the children of Israel to go over Jordan into Canaan and possess the land. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 3. Now the other matters back over in Exodus was about 40 years earlier. So here, after all this wandering, and they're to the east of Jordan, Moses is about to die. Joshua's take them over. There's a restatement of the law, and that's what Moses said, and it didn't change one bit. And immediately following this statement, Moses rehearsed to them the Ten Commandments. 
And in that Ten Commandments, of course, was the Sabbath commandment. And declared to them that this covenant was not made, notice, with their fathers, but with all who were there that day. What day? The day Moses speaks and the day they're gathered there to hear him speak. Question is raised, when was the Sabbath given? Well, the time when the Sabbath was given, I think, is clearly shown in the preceding references. But let's look at more proof from the Old Testament Scriptures. And we read again, Thou camest down also on Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Now what's interesting here is that this is in Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 13 and 14. We are many, many hundred years past the time that Moses said what he said to the children of Israel as recorded in Deuteronomy. The children of Israel have apostatized. They have been carried away into captivity and specifically he is mindful of the Babylonian captivity in which they remain for 70 years. A remnant has returned. Nehemiah and Ezra are seeking to restore and underscore that word restore. The law to Israel and Israel performing their lives as the law required in worship and daily living. And this is where we get this. This also teaches us that the restoration principle is true. Before they could restore Israel to doing what God expected Israel to do and to build a temple and under the law worship in that temple, to understand the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe, and so on, they had to have the law of God that governed them established and well in hand. So before you can have what God wants on this earth, you must have his standard of conduct. And this they did. Now, in this passage, Nehemiah 9, 13 and 14, it's affirmed that he made known to them the Sabbath. But when? On Mount Sinai. Also notice that he said it was a sign between God and Israel. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Exodus 31, 16, 17. And you can also read the same in Ezekiel 20, 10 through 12. It's important to talk about the word forever. Today we talk about forever usually equating it with eternity. There's no end to it. But that's not all the way uh, every time it was used. It's not what it meant in the Old Testament. When it says like it does here forever, it means forever as long as you are what you are. And we must understand that. As long as Israel was what God intended it to be, then they would do what the law said regarding the Sabbath. It does not mean forever in that until the end of time. And you need to keep that in mind. It's part of right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15. But we also need to ask, now why was the Sabbath given to Israel? Again, we go back to Moses' restatement of the law in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God brought thee out thence by mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm. By the way, that's his symbolic language used in the Old Testament to mean by great power God did so. Then he says, Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. I cite again Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. So the reason here is signed to why they, the Israelites of that time, should keep the Sabbath could not apply to other people. Gentiles were never servants in the land of Egypt. Notice again that it was not given to non-Jews or to Gentiles. In Deuteronomy 4 verse 8, And what great nation is there that hath statutes and ordinances so righteous 
as all this law, which I set before you this day. Again, Deuteronomy 4.8. Well, now certainly, all, put in quotes, this law includes the Sabbath law because it was a part of that law. Sabbatarians make the claim that the Ten Commandments, and you must watch this in dealing with them, is the law of God. Now, let me say that again. They assert that the Ten Commandments is the law of God as contrasted with statutes and judgments, ceremonies, etc., which were made known through Moses too and um, contend that all the law, they do, Sabbatarians, contend that all the law, except the Ten Commandments, has been done away. So if you're studying with somebody who believes in keeping the Sabbath, that's the mindset they have toward the division of the law of Moses. And it's just not the case. It's a claim, if you please, without foundation and is made by them in an effort to defend their unscriptural claim that Christians should observe the seventh day of the week, Sabbath, as did Israel. Well, let's look at this a little further. The law of Moses, the law of the Lord. We're going to look at Nehemiah. What was Nehemiah doing? He's taken the remnant, he and Ezra, and they're back in the land after the Babylonian captivity. They're going to restore the law of Moses to its right position of authority. And thus from the law they would find the authority for all things pertaining to the Levitical priesthood, the high priest, the descendants from Aaron, and all the things pertaining to the sacrifices and the work of the Levites and all of that. Of course, they'd have to build the temple. Ken, in studying the Minor Prophets, mentioned how that they neglected that and had that prophet sent to them saying, now you're building your houses, but you've forgotten to build a temple and of course they did but that's what happened now looking at Nehemiah 8.1 we're at this time of restoring and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel again Nehemiah 8.1 but now hold that let's look a little further go down to verse 18 of Nehemiah chapter 8 also day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. We go over into chapter 9 of Nehemiah and verse number 3. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, a fourth part of the day. Now what's interesting, and you're about to get into that study too, we all are, is that the writer of Hebrews would help a great deal on this. May I reference that in just a moment again, but you might want to keep Nehemiah in mind while you're studying the book of Hebrews. The 8th and ninth chapters of Nehemiah describe a protracted effort on the part of Nehemiah and all those associated with him in this effort to teach the people. They couldn't do what the law of Moses required till they had the proper respect for it and understood what it required of them. The people asked Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses. He brought the law before that assembly of people, chapter 8, verse 2. He read therein, and the people gave attention to the book of the law, chapter 8, verse 3. The words of the law, chapter 8 and verse 13. And day by day he read in the book of the law of God, chapter 8, verse 18. The book of the law of the Lord, chapter 9 and verse 3. Now you know you're supposed to take all of what the Bible says on a subject before you begin to reason with the facts gleaned to draw a proper conclusion. That's what we're trying to do here regarding the law of Moses and the law of the Lord. Because the Sabbatarians 
try to make a distinction the law of Moses or the Old Testament or the whole Bible does not make. I think anyone from these verses can see that these terms are used interchangeably. That they all refer to the same book or law. So inspired writers made no distinction. Get that. Writers inspired of the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible made no distinction between the law of Moses and the law of the Lord. Or as the American Standard says, the law of Jehovah. Even what Joshua wrote, what Joshua wrote was written, as the scripture says, in the book of the law of God. Joshua 24, verse 26. Certainly Joshua did not write on tables of stone, nor did he add to the Ten Commandments. The very thing the Sabbatarians call the law of God. Such distinction exists only in their minds. That is, those who still say we are to assemble on the seventh day of the week and keep the Sabbath as the Jews did. I think it's interesting that when you go to the New Testament, there's one brief paragraph that will help us see this clearly. Luke is the writer, or the one the Holy Spirit's inspiring to write these words. Watch him use these terms interchangeably. And when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were fulfilled, they brought him up to Jerusalem, which is Jesus, to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opened up the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Then we drop down. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, that they might do concerning him after the custom of the law. Then, and when they had accomplished all things that were according to the law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee. Luke 2, verses 22 through 39. Now many times people will say, well, what about this or what about that? And we will say, being that it's a biblical subject, let the Bible speak. Well, let the Bible have its full say, and not just partially. And that's what we're trying to do, to understand not only the design and purpose of the law of Moses, but the place of the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, under the law, and what it meant to the Jew. Now, Sabbatarians claim that the Ten Commandments are the law of God. And that this law was never to be repealed. And I've indicated that earlier. But that all the other commandments in the Old Testament were repealed. Well, they have to do this to be able to hold on to keeping the Sabbath. Well, a lawyer in Jesus' earthly ministry once asked Jesus, Which is the great commandment of the law? And he, that is Jesus, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second likened to it is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he said, On these two commandments, the whole law hangeth and the prophets. Matthew chapter 22 Verses 35 through 40. Now, these that our Lord makes reference here, these commandments, are found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. They were part of what Moses put before the people before he died and Joshua took over to take them into the land of promise, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, where they would be built into a nation. They're not in the Ten Commandments. The thing the Sabbatarians call the law of God. Thus, by their false position, they make the greatest commandments part of the law of Moses, which they say was done away. The fact is, these two commandments, these two commandments are the sum, they are the essence of the law. All the other requirements of the law including the Ten Commandments, are regulations growing out of these two fundamental commandments. Watch this. 
every law or command intended to regulate our actions in things specially pertaining to God is included in the commandment to love God with all that we are and have. And every law or command seeking to govern us in our relations to our fellow man finds its roots in the command to love our neighbors as ourselves. The whole thing. So the Sabbatarian would do away with the foundation on which all the other laws, including the Ten Commandments, rest and retain the Ten Commandments of course, without a foundation per their own reasoning, per their own position. Now, I want us to go as far as we can before we reach a stopping point. And as I said, I wasn't sure how far we would go to reach a stopping point this morning. We shall see. I want to talk a little more about the law. They, the Sabbatarians, and when I say Sabbatarians, I mean Seventh-day Church of God, or Seventh-day Adventists. Those are basically the ones. They make the con contention that the words, the law, always, without exception, have reference to the Ten Commandments. And this is just not the case. I won't read all of these, but I will give you these for your reference. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Matthew 12 and verse number 5. Matthew 22, verse 36. Acts 23, verse 3. And Acts 5, 34. If you want those, we'll give them to you later. But anyway, those are simply references in the New Testament that show that their contention that the law always has reference to the Ten Commandments is just not the case. And... In doing that, in, in gleaning these for the New Testament, you can go ahead and study and find many more references that make that very clear. Now, let's talk a little bit about moral and ceremonial law. Sabbatarians contend that the Ten Commandments are the moral law and that the law of Moses is the ceremonial law. And that the ceremonial law has been abrogated or taken out of the way. But that the law of God, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, is still in force. That is their position. If you ever sit down to study with one of them, you've got to realize these things if they're educated in their own beliefs. Let's see some of the commands in, quote, the law of Moses, unquote. Quote, the ceremonial law, unquote. And see, and see if they are ceremonies. Look at Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 and 22. And a sojourner shalt thou not wrong, neither shalt thou oppress him. For ye were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Question. Are these commands ceremonies? If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under the burden, thou shalt forbear to leave him, thou shalt release it with him. Exodus 23, 4 and 5. Then I read again from Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 6. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 16. And again, from Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19. Thou shalt not rest judgment, W-R-E-S-T, rest justice. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither shalt thou take a bribe. Question, are these commands only, I say only, ceremonies? No, oh, they're commands to be kept in your daily living. So study the Ten Commandments and see if the Sabbatarians are correct in making the claim that they are a perfect moral law. Question, and I don't know that we recognize some of this. Do the Ten Commandments forbid lying, save 
on your neighbor? Do they forbid coveting? Save only that which belongs to your neighbor. The words spoken by Moses are the law of the Lord, just as the Ten Commandments are the law of the Lord. And he who would know the law of the Lord for ancient Israel, it's imperative, they must read all the law given in that dispensation. The Ten Commandments, the fifth accepted, is a system of negative law. With the fifth commandment accepted, they do not require one to assist others in any way, no matter what may be their condition. Go back and read it. When the Israelites reached Sinai, God gave them the Ten Commandments, and they are specifically called the covenant. Exodus 34, verse 28. And he wrote, upon the tables of the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. I read further from Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13. This be 40 years later from the account of Exodus 34, 28. And he declared unto you the, his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tables of stone. But I go ahead and read in Deuteronomy 9, verses 9 through 11 on this matter. Moses said, when I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of stone of the Lord that the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me the two tables of stones written with the finger of God. Then he said, and it came to pass that at the end of forty days and forty nights, that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. Please observe, number one, the Ten Commandments are called the covenant. And number two, that God made this covenant with the Jews in Horeb and not with their fathers before them or anybody but Israelites. Notice what we have as far as the Jews' understanding of the future. They would have been well versed in this, though they wouldn't understand some of the details about it. They knew the prophets, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, though they didn't understand the nature of the Messiah, nor his kingdom. They didn't understand the design and purpose of the law of Moses, or their place as a physical nation. But they understood these words. They studied them daily. And listen about a new covenant that was to be made. Jeremiah 31 Verses 31 and 32. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Now, Sabbatarians make a distinction between God's law and the law of Moses. We brought that out throughout this lesson. God's law then is God's covenant. The one he made on Mount Sinai through Moses with Israel. In making this distinction, Sabbatarians forever ruin their plea for the continuation in perpetuity of God's law, the covenant God made. For in the foregoing quotation that we just gave, God contrasts the covenant to be made with the covenant which he had made with Israel. The new covenant to come, he contrasts, even in writing the Old Testament, with the law of Moses. And shows that the covenant he made with Israel was to be superseded by a new one. Now here's where I said earlier, in the upcoming study of Hebrews, watch how the inspired writer reasons to convince his audience who have believed in Christ and obeyed the gospel, of not leaving the New Testament or covenant. The 8th and the ninth and the 10th chapter, as we have it in our Bibles of Hebrews, will deal with this very thing. And you'll see that God has made a new covenant, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, 
And thus, as Christ said in Matthew 28, verse 18, all power authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And thus, we see too from John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, I'm going to pause here because it seems we ought to pause at this point because we're emphasizing what the New Testament does concerning the law of Moses, its design, purpose, and cessation. Colossians 2 and verse 14. That it was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Galatians 3.24 and that it has been taken out of the way as far as it being authoritative and with it went Sabbath day keeping but we'll develop this more the Lord willing this afternoon sermon by looking at the matters that deal a little further with their view now if you're going to be saved from your sins today you're not going to go back to the Old Testament and learn from Moses or Jeremiah or Isaiah God's plan of salvation to become a Christian. You must go to the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the New Covenant. The one Jeremiah prophesied would come. That would not only govern all Hebrews, all Jews, but everybody else, Gentile alike. For we are made all one, united in Christ through the belief and obedience to the same gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. So to become a Christian today, one is not circumcised and keeps the law as the Jew had to under the law of God, the law of Moses. But one must from the heart believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10.17. One must repent of one's sins, for we're commanded to in Acts 17 and verse 30. Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Then we're to confess our faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32. Now when a person reaches that stage, they're ready to complete their obedience to Christ and being baptized by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a saved relationship with them. For in order to obtain the remission or forgiveness of past and alien sins. Having your sins cleansed by the blood of Christ as you're baptized into his death where he shed his blood, Romans 6, 3, and 4. You're then raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ, the Lord having added you to his church, Acts 2, verse 38 and 47. And therein you live, worshiping as the New Testament teaches, living as the New Testament teaches, if you please, running your mind and your life according to the teachings of the gospel, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. We are promised that if we do that, we're being faithful to him in all that we believe and practice, and that we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord when we stand before him in judgment, when time is no more, and there looms before us a vast eternity. And we must meet our Lord to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, or if you're a child of God and you sinned, and you must repent and confess those sins as a second law of pardon, we urge you to do that. As we offer this invitation, and this song is sung to encourage you to respond to the gospel of Christ in obedience to it while we stand, while we sing.